Good morning. Let's see if you know the post-Easter opener. This is the day the Lord has made. It was there. It just wasn't all together. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Blue cards, if you're a guest today, do just what everybody else is doing. Fill them out and drop them in the offering plate later on. Josh is going to lead us into ministry. This is the last second organization up there. So <laughs> let me tell you that a couple of other neat things happened this morning. I get to talk about the joy of giving, but Lena and Morgan are going to talk about the joy of knowing Jesus. So their uh, faith sharing moment is going to come right after sermon time this morning. Can I let you guys take over? All right, sure. here we go. Good morning and welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church. We're very happy to have you with us this morning, whether a visitor or a guest or a returning member. Um, as we begin this beautiful day in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we invite you to stand and worship with us as we sing, I Will Call Upon the Lord. Continue in worship, you may be seated. Shall I fear? Whom then shall I be? 
these troubles, but until that day comes, still I will praise you, still I will praise you. this morning by inviting our scripture reader to come forward. The first reading for the fourth Sunday of Easter is from Acts chapter 20. Now from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time, from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit and knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and affliction await me. But I do not accord, account my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for Three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from the Revelation to St. John, chapter 7. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power 
and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Why are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. You know, if you were sharp in that, you caught that Jesus is both the lamb and the shepherd. He plays both roles. This is the week of the year where we get to say, the Lord is my shepherd. So let's stand right now and use this as our confession of trust and faith today, all together. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's talk to the Lord for a moment. Lord Jesus, you are the good shepherd, and we're so thankful that you shepherd us through life, that you lead us along the paths, and we get to listen to your voice. But we confess that sometimes when the storms of life come along, it's hard for us to picture those green pastures and those still waters and, and sometimes when death casts its long shadow over a part of our life or a part of our family it's hard to trust that you will actually take us through the valley of the shadow of death and yet when we look back over the years we too can say surely goodness and mercy has followed me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so, Lord Jesus, today we confess to you our weakness of faith, those moments of lack of trust, and we ask you to forgive us and cleanse us and fill up our heart with trust that you are the good shepherd and that you will lead us day by day. Receive God's assurance now through Jesus' death on the cross. All those moments of lack of trust are forgiven. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing again. As we continue in worship, the elders will be coming around to gather prayer cards. Oh, 
trust in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have made my ransom. But this I know with all my heart. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have made my ransom. The Gospel of our Lord. From John chapter 10, each year on this Sunday we read a different portion. The most familiar is the first portion where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. But note at the end of this section as you're listening, he explains what a joy it is for us that he shepherds us along. So here's the story from John 10. At that time, the Feast of Dedication was taking place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So... The Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you're not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, he's greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand, for I and the Father are one. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Good news to share. Share that peace of Christ with one another right now. Let no one be a stranger. Hug everybody who's been here for first or last time. comfortable. This gospel message of the Good Shepherd just has all kinds of amazing impacts in our, our life together. And So let's just look for a minute at some of the things that are, are going on around here. Do you have the announcement slides in there before the sermon? Or maybe they didn't make it into this PowerPoint. Bridge the Future, there it is. Did any of you get the letter already at your house? So if you didn't yet, there's a whole lot more detail in that letter about where we're going with a dual campaign. I don't need to talk about that right now. So read the letter when it comes. The next piece is this really exciting piece of news. 3.30, Thursday afternoon, the report comes back from this team of nine people. Well, seven of them actually were on our campus, but they'd been studying all the materials that we passed on, and then they spent time with us, the National Lutheran Schools Accreditation Team. In the report, they said, you're doing great stuff. That's a, a four-word summary. <laughs> So praise God for what he gets done in our ministry together. We decided to put it in big print this week, April 29th, so you can actually read. That's when the spring festival is coming, and it's at 5.30 on a Friday evening when folks from the CDC and all of us can interchange and, and interact and fellowship together. And finally, baptism celebration. Last I heard, seven kids are signed up to be baptized either at the three-year-old chapel service or at the, the BPK through eighth grade chapel service on the 27th. If you want to see joy flowing freely, you're invited to any of those uh, chapel opportunities. And right now, I think we're ready to dig into God's word together. So uh, here's, here's the test of the pastor this morning. Right after the sermon, we're going to hear from two of our young people what their faith is all about. And, and so I'm up against some, some really great voices this morning. 
So I'm, I get to talk about the fun stuff, though, and, and that is how to enjoy your giving. <clears throat> so right at the very end of, of what Mary Jo read to us from Acts before, there's this quote, and it's the only time Jesus is specifically quoted in Acts because he's already ascended into heaven. How is he talking down here on earth? Well, he says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, what I want to do is, is take you on a journey of Paul's growth in generosity. Because last week, if you were here, you heard Acts chapter 9, the conversion of Saul, and he's renamed Paul, and the Lord has touched his heart, and he becomes a witness to the, the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> but then we skipped 11 chapters, and here we are in Acts chapter 20. Paul's quoting something that he's discovered walking with the Lord. It's more blessed to give than to receive. I suspect his journey started in Damascus, that place where he was converted. <clears throat> You remember what happened? He immediately starts preaching the gospel, and, and Christians are amazed. He, really? He, Saul, persecutor? And the Jews are angry because he's turned and become a supporter of the risen Lord Jesus, and they run him, well, they're going to kill him. And you remember how he got out of town? This is a great Sunday school story. Over the wall in a basket. Do you remember that? How big a basket? <laughs> Where would you find something? Anyway, I suspect that that moment when Paul realizes he's not alone, the people of God rescue him from imminent death, was the start of his journey of generosity. Look at how these people have blessed me. Yeah, I want to be like that. Well, <clears throat> we're going <coughs> to excuse me, jump over Acts 10, 11, and 12 because they're all about Jerusalem and Peter. But in Acts 13, Paul shows up again and the church at Antioch is putting hands on him and blessing him and setting him aside to go out and plant churches. Paul is up for the job. Do you remember who his partner was? First missionary journey? Say Barnabas. <laughs> yeah, Paul and Barnabas. Second journey was Silas, and we'll get to Silas in a minute. But, but Barnabas, the little bit we know about him, you can read in Acts 5, verse 36, it says he was a Levite, that means he had Jewish ancestry. He was born in Cyprus, that island out in the middle of the Mediterranean. Somehow he had gotten to Jerusalem, and it says he got so excited about this new ministry right after Jesus had ascended into heaven, spirit had come down, that he sold a field and gave the proceeds to the church. Generosity just filled Barnabas's heart. Anybody tell him to do that? There's nothing in the Bible about it. It seems like it was just spur of the moment i got to say thank you to my Lord. Key number one to the joy of giving is generosity starts in your own heart. God touches you through the love of Christ. It's not something that's forced. So where did Paul and Barnabas go on their mission trip? This journey is, is fascinating. So where did Barnabas grow up? Cyprus. So where did Paul and Barnabas go first? Yeah. You, you know Paul grew up in Tarsus, which is up in Asia Minor. That's where he wanted to go, all those people in that region. I picture this conversation. Paul, if I'm going to go with you, we just got to go back to where I grew up first. Can't we just sail through Cyprus and then on up to Asia Minor? And they do, and, and the governor of the island is converted. Marvelous thing. And, and so this team is enjoying how the gospel of Jesus Christ is just touching hearts and changing lives. So now, if you know anything about... Turkey, Asia Minor, there's a lot of hills and, and, and people had to walk back then and they covered hundreds of miles. So have you ever gone up for a walk with somebody and never said a word? No, it doesn't work that way, right? So Paul and Barnabas had hours and hours and hours of conversation. So I, I filled in here, a little docudrama kind of stuff. So uh, Barnabas says, Paul, I, I know what you're doing now, but how has your life, how has your heart changed since you first met Jesus. And I know from what Paul has written that he would have said things like this. He said, you know, as a Pharisee, I was totally committed to the rules and regulations. I knew how to do the right thing. But now, the motivation is totally different. That great little verse from Galatians chapter 5, let love make you serve one another. Not because somebody says you have to do it. No, let the love that Christ has put in your heart make you do it. 
So I, I picture the, the conversation turning around and, and Paul saying, well, Barnabas, you know, I, I heard you got, got converted down there in, in Jerusalem. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, Barnabas explains, well, you know, as, as a Levite, you understand that. Our family was part of the group that was responsible for taking care of the temple. That's what Levites do. But we lived in Cyprus, and so we were a long way from the temple. But when I got to Jerusalem and I met these amazingly excited followers of Jesus, and I saw what was going on, my heart was just touched, and I sold a field, and I donated the money because I just wanted to be like Jesus. I know Jesus didn't care one little bit about earthly possessions. And, and so they're sharing along the way, and this journey of generosity is being developed. Years later, Paul writes to the Corinthians. I'll tell you how he got there in a little bit. You've got this verse memorized. I'll say the first three words, and you fill it in. God loves a cheaters. <laughs> but you knew it anyway, right? Yeah, God loves a cheerful giver. What I picture is when Paul wrote that, he saw Barnabas' smiling face right in front of his eyes. That's the way it's supposed to happen. People are just moved by the love of the Lord Jesus to share what they have, and great things happen. So, when he's with these Corinthians, he writes to them about giving a special love offering. No rules. He just says, you know, the people back in Jerusalem, they're going through famine, hard times. I, I want to take something back to them. Would you help me? I'm not laying down any rules. I just want you to be like Jesus. And then he describes what that means. Rich as he was, he made himself poor. He came down to planet Earth for your sake in order to make you rich, spiritually rich, by his poverty. Which takes us to key number two, to enjoy your giving. Generosity is motivated in your heart by the heart of Jesus himself. In fact, Paul says that all kinds of places, but this one is powerful. He says, we are ruled, because he used to be ruled by laws, we are ruled by the love of Christ. He died for all so that those who live shouldn't live for themselves anymore, but for him who died and was raised to life for their sake. Motivation is totally different. Okay. Personal, here at Trinity. God has you at Trinity, not out there in Asia Minor, or not on the island of Cyprus. He's got you here at this time in history. And we're talking about renewing our pledges to the ongoing work of ministry at Trinity, and at the same time, fixing up our campus. This building, the bridge to the future, the place needs work. We've got a beautiful new facility, but the other ones are in need of some, some love, some TLC. And there's this tendency for folks to wonder, and I love when I, when I hear it asked this way, so are they, those, those leaders of the church that I don't know personally, are they going to try to squeeze blood out of a turnip? Which is a confession that you see yourself as a turnip. <laughs> so I, I, I teased somebody last week about that. Well, do you really think that's the way life works in churches? It said the only way blood is involved in an in a opportunity campaign like this is Jesus shed his blood on the cross for me. And I am eternally grateful. I want to do whatever it takes to share that love of Jesus with others. The blood of Christ motivates me. Or, like I get to sing with the three-year-olds, I've got the love of Jesus, love of Jesus down in my... You know, whatever language you use to say it, it's the same story, right? The motivation comes from Jesus in your heart which allows me to say, and with full confidence, to say, if your giving is motivated by anything other than the love of God, the love of Jesus who makes the love of God clear to us, if it's motivated by anything else, don't give it. God loves a... Yeah, one whose heart has gotten excited because of what they've seen of the Lord's generosity in their lives. Practical application. The term live large... Been around for, what, a decade or so? Taco Bell. What's their version? Live Mas. I don't know Spanish, but I, I think that's the same thing, right? <laughs> Live large. So in my generation, the, the interpretation of that was get all the gusto you can out of life, right? Any of you remember that phrase? Go for the gusto. The G in large is all about getting, right? It's all about me, Live larger is the Bible's message. And the G in larger is all about giving. It's all about generosity. It's all about the attitude of gratitude. 
It's look what Jesus did for me. He died to forgive my sins, and now he's promising to shepherd me all the way home to heaven. How can I not be generous to others the way he's been generous to me? And so generosity starts where? Well, in my heart, but when it's been touched by the heart of God as Jesus makes that heart clear to us. Okay, now back to Paul. Got to wrap up his journey to generosity. So on his second missionary trip, now he's got Silas with him. The Spirit nudges him. Maybe you've read this in Acts 16. The Spirit says, go this way, go this way, go this way. And, and what he's doing is saying, you're done in Asia Minor. You need to get over to Europe which is really good for us because many of us have European ancestry, and if he hadn't done that, Europe would never have met Jesus Christ. So, how does he get there? He goes north. If you can picture any of this geography, I wish we had maps in your Bible so you could open it up. The Aegean Sea is between Asia Minor and Greece, and at the top of the Aegean Sea, there's this Roman road that goes across, and it runs through a town called Philippi. Does that ring a bell for any of you Bible scholars? The Philippians... And, and so Philippi, that's a good Greek name, Philip of Macedon. That's who it was named after. But by the time Paul gets there, it's a Roman city. And, and it's, a, it's a center of commerce. You know how the Romans built roads? And we got to visit Philippi probably five years ago. And in and, and the, the ruins that have been excavated, you can see the amazing Roman highway. Nobody else had roads like that back then. And you can see the colonnades and the columns of the, the forum where the business was conducted. So, what's the big deal about Philippi in the Bible? Well, some of you know that in Acts chapter 16, this woman named Dorcas, right? No. Acts chapter 16 is about Lydia, seller of... You probably know the history. <laughs> seller of purple cloth. Her roots were back in Asia Minor in a town called Thyatira, and their only claim to fame, they didn't have any, any commerce going on, but they made the dyes that were used for the textile industry, and so the rich and luxurious purple cloth, that's where Lydia came from. Now, she was a smart woman, apparently, because she knows where the dye comes from. She's got the resource chain lined up, and, and she brings this stuff in her little textile selling process to Philippi, where the commerce is going through there, and, and apparently she's got a great business going, and Paul, when he gets to, to Philippi, hears that this, this little group of, of women who are godly are praying down by the river. And he goes to them, tells them, you know, I grew up like that too, but I've, I've discovered something else. Jesus is God's way of offering us assurance of forgiveness. And Lydia asked to be baptized and rest of the people there. And, and, and Lydia says, you know, Paul, as long as you're in town here, I can put you up. God's blessed me with resources. I'm, I'm adding a little more to the text, but it's real obvious that this is the way it, it went down. Because later on, well, here's what happened. So Philippi's up there. Paul goes over to Thessalonica, Berea, down to Athens and then across the Isthmus to Corinth. Later on, he writes back to the Philippians, you guys were the only ones who supported me as I went onward to those various other towns. And you are part of the blessing of sharing the love of Jesus Christ. Well, that generosity from the Philippians must have touched him because when he's with these Corinthians, and, and you know their story, they were the, the toughest crowd that he had to deal with anywhere along. You read 1 Corinthians, you know that they had all kinds of problems in their church. But he's going to teach them generosity. So he says, when I go back to Jerusalem, it would just be so cool if, if I could say the Corinthians, everybody knew that in the Roman Empire, have gathered up this offering for the poor people back in Jerusalem. The key, number three, the joy of giving, is that generosity grows as love overflows from your heart into the lives of other people when you see an opportunity. Which finally leads us to getting pretty close to our text and the part that I love. In Acts 19, Paul finally gets to Ephesus. Now, that's like the Orlando of the area because he had been planting churches all around, like up in Ocala and, and down in Okeechobee and everywhere else. And he says, now i got to get right to the center of commerce on the, the, the border of the Aegean Sea because people are going every which way and I can send messages to those churches I founded and I can send business people to found churches in new places like Colossae and, and so on. And in Ephesus, he stays for two years. It's like he's got a mini-seminary going on. He's rented a room at, at Rollins College or UCF. 
lecture hall of Tyrannus is, is the one in Ephesus. And he's sending people out to encourage existing churches and, and to start new churches. Maybe it's more like he rented a, an office space right across from the county courthouse. Oh, Trinity did that, right? Well, we bought it. <laughs> And, and we're saying, we want to be right in the middle of everything that goes on in downtown because Ephesus was like that, center of commerce. And, and so <clears throat> at the end of his time, in fact, his, his, his return trip to Ephesus and the last time he gets to see those people, he says to them, you guys know me. I have not wanted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. Why did he put that in there? Probably because he's thinking about Lydia <laughs> and the Philippians. Ah, her purple cloth, that supported ministry. It's not what I wanted to wear. You yourselves know that I've worked with these hands of mine to provide everything. <clears throat> you know the term bi- bivocational pastor? Somebody who does ministry but supports himself, raises his own salary. Paul is not just a bivocational pastor. He says everything that my companions and I have needed. His little tent-making cottage industry that he takes with him wherever he goes, it supplies all of his needs, so never does he have to be a burden to a church. I would love to come into a church someday and say, I don't need a thing. I just get the joy of preaching the gospel to you. That, that's the way Paul was. So this generosity just exudes from this guy, and, and as he tells them in his summary statement, I've shown you in all things that by working hard in this way, We must help the weak, remembering the words that our Lord Jesus himself said. Finally, back to the text, there is more happiness, more joy, more blessing in giving than in receiving. Now, we all know that. You love to give presents at birthdays and Christmas time and it just feels wonderful in your own heart and see the joy on somebody else's faces. All of that says to me, there is no simple formula for any one of us to decide how much we're going to give to the ongoing work of Trinity or over and above for the facilities that need fixing up. There is no simple formula. It's something that grows out of a heart that has learned over a lifetime to grow in generosity. What's obvious to me is God is not done with Trinity yet. Some churches are dead by 100, right? You guys are 97, and you're on the verge of a revival. (laughs) And that is just so exciting to see, and I'm going to be listening a year from now when I'm someplace else as to how all of this continues to go forward. God isn't done with me either, and I'm saying this to help us think about just all the different points. So Carol and I know that, okay, we come down here for a while, and we get blessed by being together with you all, and, and then I think we're supposed to do another intentional interim somewhere. Pretty soon I turned 70 and then full Social Security, and, and, and that's the point where I would love to be able to say, we're taken care of. Can we find a house where we can put up pastors and wives for a week at a time? We're just worn out from what ministry does. I'm not sure that that's what God is telling us to do, but, but that's the way it is when you're trying to figure out how you use what you've been given. Okay, God, show me the way. There is no specific formula, and that's why that good shepherd theme is so great. I listen to the shepherd's voice. I know his voice, and I follow him, which is the message for today as we talk about how we're going to do our giving, regular ministries, how we're going to do special giving for facilities. You listen to the shepherd's voice. Why does God want it to be that way? He wants a relationship with each one of us, a personal relationship. There's no formulas. There's no rules and regulations. This is the way it has to be done. I want it to flow from the joy within your heart, and I want it to fit your circumstances in life. And and so uh, as we're doing this campaign, I'm thinking there's some young people around here who are just getting started on giving. In fact, on Easter Sunday mornings, where do all those young couples come from? (laughs) And I'll bet that a fair number of them really haven't thought very carefully about biblical principles about giving. And so wouldn't it be great if in this this process that we're going through, some of our our youngest givers say, oh, yeah, I could start giving regularly. 
I could start thinking about what proportion of my income I give to the Lord, because everybody's at different points in the process. Hmm. What dawned on me is that tithing is generosity 101. Some of us have kind of thought that tithing is, oh! But then you look at the Bible, and it's a starting point. God's saying, I will provide for you. Pray to me. Give us this day our... Yeah, you know that one too, right? And he says, out of the 100% of what I give you, live off a of 90%. Live larger. You know, just enjoy all the stuff that I'm giving you. Just reserve 10% and return it back to me. Why 10%? It's not the number 10 that's important. It's just a big enough slice to remember who gave it all to you. So you're looking at giving and saying, I think I ought to start at a tithe. I can do that. Carol and I started at 8% 44 years ago. Next year we got to 10%. It stayed that way ever since. But somebody else is going, oh, I've taken on car payments and cell phones and mortgage, and I don't think I can do that. Well, start at 1%. No law that you have to do it all at once. Generosity 101. Figure out how to set aside that chunk that God has said that you'll enjoy doing once you... Figure out that he's the blesser. This is the day the Lord has made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it as we share what he's given to us. But some of you aren't at that start of giving. You're in the productive earning years, and, and, and you know I've been resourced pretty wonderfully by God, and yeah, I can consider the possibility of over and above giving. Kind of interesting how that works. You know, Carol and I get to the point where the two boys are, are out of college, and then... Next, I, I think we went through six capital campaigns together. And, and number four, if I've got this straight, I was trying to think it through in the 8 o'clock service. Number four was when our daughter had just graduated from high school and one more round of college tuitions. And I think we're really supposed to support. It was the big one, you know, like the, the facility over here, the, the school building. And gotta, gotta, gotta find a way to do this. And, and I, if I remember accurately, that was the time that we said, okay, tuition, interest rates falling down, let's refinance and let's take a chunk of cash out and just give it as a gift. That worked for us at that time in our life. Next time, 2006, Sarah's already graduated from college and we're saying, wow, we can actually take a vacation. We got a little freedom. And, and we're, different points in life, different responsibility levels. And so the point is, again, there is no set formula. The church cannot tell you what the right thing to do is. It's between you and the Lord. And that great shepherd will give you peace about what he wants you to do at this point in your life. Now, somewhere along the way, you start to realize when you're driving down the road of life that there's more years in the rearview mirror than there are <laughs> out in front of you. And, and you hear Jesus saying, to whom much is given, of him much shall be required, and you've lived long enough to know, wow, I've been blessed. Yeah, there were ups and downs. There were tough times, but I've been blessed. I, I, I need to figure out how to, how to say thank you in an appropriate way. And then, then Jesus ratchets it up a notch. I, I love this little verse, Luke 12, 48, to whom much more is given, of him much more shall be required, and we just know down inside God's calling us to make a difference while there still is time. For some of us, that might mean finally wrapping up that planned giving, uh, bequest plan, so that what can be given to the Lord's work actually gets there. It doesn't go through probate and, and, and get lost in the process. For some of us, it might be that moment where I don't think I have many years left. This might be the time for me, me to make the gift of a lifetime. But at the other end of the cycle, might be the time for me to try 1% giving. There is no formula. The point is God loves a cheerful giver. There's more blessing, there's more happiness in giving than receiving. Paul's journey to the joy of generosity is well documented in Scripture. Us sharing with each other about how our generosity has grown a great way for us to figure out 
where God is taking us next and celebrating. Surely, goodness and mercy have followed me all the days of my life. And on top of that, I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? Amen. It's time to gather offerings right now because we're just about ready for, Lena, where's, where's Morgan? You ready in about three minutes? You and Lena are going to figure it out? Okay. Let's, uh, I don't know. Let's, let's look. I, I, I'm out of sync here. So what does it say? Right. Yeah, this morning, okay. Offering time. Let's, let's gather offerings right now and let's sing this great give thanks song while we're, while we're doing it. you pour into our lives, accept these gifts of gratitude that we brought to you today, but thank you in advance for what we're going to get to see in just a moment, the, the working of the gift of faith, simple trust in you as Savior, in Lena's life and in, in Morgan's life, and give them calm spirits so that they can speak what they have thought through and, and want to share with all of us about what they know of you and how blessed they are to be children of God. Bless them as we hear their message now. Okay, so who's going first? I thought it was Lena. Okay, so Morgan's good doing it. And we're going to make sure that you're lined up here and that your voice is coming through. Are you okay with just holding your, your paper there? Yeah. You don't need a stand or anything? No. Okay, say a little more so we make sure that sound is working. Say, hi, I love you. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're on. I believe in the triune God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. God the Father created the world, God the Son came to earth and saved us from our sins, and the Holy Spirit lives in us and keeps us in the faith. Jesus said in John 15, 26, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. I believe that our God is eternal, almighty, holy, merciful, and that he is love. I believe that God is my Father through faith in Christ and that he is the Father of all people. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. I believe God created all things in six days simply by his word and that he still takes care of us with his wisdom and power. All of our food, clothing, shelter, family, and friends are given to us by him. The Catechism states that God is the Father of all people 
because he created them. The Apostles' Creed also states, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe that Jesus Christ, his only son, died for our sins. I believe that he was crucified on the cross to save us from our sins, and that he rose again after three days. I know and most certainly trust that Jesus Christ is my savior from sin, death, and the devil, and I trust that he gives me eternal life. I know all of this because in the Apostles' Creed, I confess Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. I believe this is true because Jesus prayed for me on the night he was betrayed, and it is written in John 17, this is eternal life, and they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I believe there are two sacraments for receiving grace. One is baptism, and the other is the Lord's Supper. I believe that baptism makes you a child of God. Baptismal water is not just plain water, but water that is combined with God's word. Baptism washes away people's sins, no matter what or how they sinned. God wants everyone to be baptized, like it states in Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I believe the Lord's Supper is the body and the blood of Christ Jesus, the bread being his body and the wine being his blood. I believe that the first Lord's Supper took place on the night before Jesus was betrayed. I know that Jesus instituted the sacrament of the altar because in the Bible it states that he said, this do in remembrance of me when he gave the disciples the bread, which he said was his body, and the wine, which he said was his blood. I believe that God gives eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. I know I have eternal life because I believe in Christ, and he gives believers eternal life out of pure grace, not because of anything they, I, have done. This is true because in John chapter 10 it states, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Prayer is a way to communicate with God. In prayer, we can ask for his forgiveness and ask God to help with something. You can pray anywhere, anytime, or with anyone. God doesn't really care. Prayer doesn't have to be in a specific format as long as you are speaking to God from your heart. Jesus gave us an example of a good way to pray by teaching us the Lord's Prayer. Christians around the world use this prayer as a way of talking to God. Praying regularly is something God wants us to do as a way to keep him closer to us. If God hadn't sacrificed himself for our sins, we wouldn't have eternal life because God can't be with sin. Since he did die for our sins, all people who believe in him now have eternal life with God. Now, when I sin, instead of being separated from God, I can just ask for his forgiveness and I will still have eternal life. Jesus conquered death and the devil's power when he rose after three days. Death and the devil have no hold on me. Now, knowing that, I can live my life without being worried about death. I can go around without a dark shadow of sin around me. I am secure in the knowledge that I have a place in heaven. You can't know how good it makes mom and dad and your sister feel and the whole congregation to hear all that coming from your heart. So let's, let's check it out. Make sure your sound is coming through. Hi. You're not going to say I love you either, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you know that, that you've heard Lena's voice many times from up in the balcony, but today from up front, please tell us the story of your faith. What do I believe? Understanding and growing in my Christian faith and Lutheran beliefs is a part of our confirmation studies. Through my home, school, and church, I've been taught and believed that Jesus Christ was born, was crucified, and rose from the dead so that my sins are forgiven and I will have eternal life. But there's much more to the question of what do I believe? I believe in the triune God, which is God the Father, the creator of all that exists. Jesus Christ, the Son who became human to suffer and die for our sins and to rise again in victory over death and Satan. And finally, the Holy Spirit, who creates faith through God's word and sacraments. The three persons of the Trinity are co-equal and co-eternal. There is only one God. 
I believe that God created me even though I was born from a woman and man. I believe that God created the universe in six days and rested on the seventh. The land and sea, sky, plants, and all the animals, day, night, sun, moon, and stars, birds and fish, man and woman, God created them all. It is our job to take care of and respect all that God has made for us. I believe that when you're baptized, you're brought into God's family. Your sins are forgiven, washed away by the holy water, and words spoken. We are baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God, parents, and parents, speak on a baby's behalf at your baptism. In Mark 10, 13 to 15, Jesus says to bring the little children to him and do not let them go. I was baptized on November 27, 2004. I was only 16 months old. Pastor Moore baptized me right here, and Uncle Rich, Amy, and Amanda stood next to my parents. My sins were forgiven, and I was now part of God's family. I believe that the Lord's Supper is also called communion and the sacrament of the altar. I received my first communion in the sixth grade. I believe that the bread and wine are in, with, and under the body and blood of Jesus Christ. It is through faith that we receive the blessings of this holy meal. We are at one with God and participate with our church and family. I believe that prayer is talking directly to God through thoughts and spoken word. There are four parts to prayer. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. We should pray regularly and frequently. The Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf when we do not know what we should pray about. Romans 8, 26 to 27 tells us this. An important prayer we have is the Lord's Prayer. A prayer that I say weekly, sometimes more than twice. Those words are memorized at a young age. I can't remember not knowing the Lord's Prayer. God invites us to pray with boldness, boldness and confidence. We pray for God to protect us from evil and that his good and gracious will will be done. I believe that eternal life is living with Jesus in heaven. Heaven is perfect and without sin. God has prepared a place for us in heaven. John 3.16 that says, whoever believes in him will have eternal life. So if we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we will spend eternity with God in heaven. I believe that Jesus Christ was born from Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit, and performed many miracles in his lifetime. He suffered death by crucifixion and rose three days later. I believe that Jesus is true God and also true man. My sins are forgiven because of Jesus' death and resurrection. I believe this because it says that in the Bible. God keeps us in his harms and keeps his promises as well. God sacrificed his son for me. He loves me just that much. I believe that as a Christian, we are called to share the gospel with others. I'm not without sin and I need forgiveness. I have that forgiveness when I participate in the Lord's Supper and trust in my Savior. Thank you, Lena. Have they set the bar pretty high for the rest of their class? <laughs> yeah, and what a, what a great thing. Walking, talking sermons, right to the very heart of the matter. So let's stand now for our, our prayer time. Gracious God, thank you for the faith of these two witnesses here today, Lena and Morgan. Bless them as they continue to grow in service to you. The joy of their <clears throat> confirmation retreat coming up on April 30th and then confirmation day on May 15th, stepping stones in a life devoted to you. Because we have devoted our lives to you, Lord, <clears throat> we, we look for opportunities to say thank you. And, and we ask that in this capital campaign and, and regular stewardship campaign that you show us the ways that you desire for us to be generous and give us joy in doing it. We ask also that the folks who met on our campus last night, the roundtable discussion from the, the group led by Reverend Bruce Leesky dealing with how to support persecuted Christians and Jews around the world, that that, that ministry will be blessed and and people will be kept safe because of the prayers and because of the interventions that, that they support. Lord, also we give you great thanks for the good words that came from the accreditation team about the ministry of our, all of our, our grades, all the way from infants to eighth grade here on campus. Help us to use all the resources entrusted to us to, to spread the gospel in powerful and meaningful ways. Lord, so many other things to pray for, but some specific petitions this morning. Heavenly Father, we give you Linda fighting cancer. Ask for healing and for you to be with her. 
Lord, also we give you Virgil and ask for successful heart surgery and healing afterwards, recovery. And Father, also we give you Len with a broken femur, waiting surgery and just uh, healing and quick healing for, for him also. And also for, for Norma, suffering a broken hip, we ask for quick and good healing for her. Um, she's Justin Tayon's uh, grandmother. We also pray for him that he can uh, take care of her and not worry. Lord, also we ask for uh, good biopsy results for me. And Father, also we ask you to be with Kathy and Carl concerning their health, be with them. Lord, also we give a, a thanks and praise for a healthy birth of Arilla Lynn. And Father, we ask you to be with the citizens of Ecuador after the earthquake, and particularly for Jackson and the group from Orangewood Christian on a mission there. Please keep them safe, Lord. And Father, we give you Cutter and ask for your peace in his life struggles. And Lord, also we give you Darcy, asking for a door of opportunity to open for employment and patience while she waits. And Lord, let Skip know and feel that you are with him during his difficult times. And fathers, we also ask for blessings on the call committee, waiting on the person that you've picked out to be our senior pastor. But particularly this afternoon as we conduct some interviews, we ask you to be in those interviews and guide them, Lord. And Father, just bless those that have given us these prayers to you and thanksgivings to you today. And Lord, thank you for Pastor Martin for bringing us here to us and also bless him and his ministry here. And Lord, thank you for the things that we've seen here and learned here today, and we ask you to send us out with those message. Lord, in your mercy, in our prayer. These and all our prayers we lift up to you, Father, in the words of Jesus, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The meal that seals the deal. Our Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took the bread of the Passover meal and broke it, gave thanks to God, and said to his disciples, Take heed, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper that night, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Please, Lord Jesus, bless us as we participate of your holy meal, where you are both the host and the one who is the meal for us. We pray in your name.
sing the last verse. Just as I am, thy love unknown, as broken every barrier down, now to be thine, yea, thine, alone, O Lamb of God, I come, I And let's pass on the blessing of God. If you're comfortable, make the cross together with me. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. And as is our tradition, would our tambourine player please come forward? <laughs> Next time, it could be you. Peace and serve the Lord. One, two, one, two, three.